Scott Bledsoe is the first person. He's a PhD candidate in political science at George Mason. Brian Cannon is the executive director of One Virginia 2021. And Delegate Mark Levine, uh, 45th District with some of Arlington, some of Fairfax County, and some of the city of Alexandria. So <laughs> with that, uh, Scott. Good evening, everyone. Um, in 1812, the governor of Massachusetts, Elbridge Gary, signed into law a bill that created a politically favorable district in Boston that strangely resembled the shape of a salamander. The Boston Gazette, in good editorial fashion, put two and two together and labeled it gerrymandering, which, after a few centuries of good, old-fashioned American English, gave us what we know today as gerrymandering. At its core, this is what gerrymandering does. Not creating electoral districts to look like odd figures or strange designs, but to modify, amend, and adjust electoral district boundaries so a particular political party has a political advantage. This is often done through cracking a district, which spreads the voting block and power of the opposite party across districts, or through packing, which concentrates an opposition's party, opposition party's voting power in one district in order to diminish it in other districts. In February of this year, as many of you know, since you're all here tonight, <laughs> the Virginia House of Delegates and the Virginia Senate passed a proposed gerrymandering reform amendment, which would amend the Virginia Constitution and create a 16-member advisory commission made up of a combination of legislative and citizen commissioners and establish redistricting criteria for congressional and state legislative districts. This commission would be responsible for the drawing of new congressional and state maps, essentially taking that power away from the General Assembly and placing it into this new independent commission. The crux of this reform would be the establishment of this independent commission. How then would this commission be chosen and how would the commissioners be chosen themselves? Well, the eight legislative commissioners would be split evenly between the House of Delegates and State Senate, with each chamber sending two Democrats and two Republicans selected by party leadership. The remaining eight citizen commissioners would be selected through the following process, and everyone stay with me here. The Chief Justice of the Virginia Supreme Court submits a list of retired circuit court judges to both parties' leaders in the House and the Senate, each leader then selects a judge on the list to sit on a redistricting commission selection committee. The four appointed judges then choose a fifth member from that list through majority vote. The four legislative leaders then submit a list of 16 nominees to that selection committee, and that selection committee selects two candidates from each list by majority vote to serve on the commission. There are no requirements as to party affiliation of the person selected to serve on the commission. The, eligib the eligibility requirements for commissioners would be only as follows. One must be a citizen of Virginia and meet any additional criteria adopted by the Virginia General Assembly. In addition, no member of Congress or the Virginia General Assembly or an employee of a member of Congress or the Virginia General Assembly may be a citizen commissioner. Once this commission is formed, there will be a two-step process on how a new map is approved and recommended to the legislature. In an effort to be bipartisan, the first step in this process is that any map must receive votes from at least six of the eight legislative and citizen commissioners. And any plan for the House of Delegates and State Senate must receive votes from three of the four members of each body who serve on the commission. The second step in this process is the vote, a vote on the plans by the General Assembly, with no amendments or no gubernatorial veto permitted. The vote must take place within 15 days of the date on which the plan was submitted. If rejected, the commission then has another 14 days to approve and submit a new plan 
which the General Assembly must vote on within seven days of receiving that. If the Commission fails to submit a map by the deadline, or the General Assembly fails to approve a plan, the Virginia Supreme Court would then be the ones tasked with drawing the lines. Lastly and finally, in the interest of public accountability and transparency, the Commission must hold at least three public hearings in different parts of the state before proposing or voting on a plan. All Commission meetings will be open to the public and all Commission communications and documents would also be part of the public record. With Virginia scheduled to redraw its legislative and congressional districts in 2021, the proposed gerrymandering reform amendment and its respective pros and cons will shape politics in Virginia in significant ways moving forward. Hopefully, I've done my job in laying out the cold hard facts tonight um, about Virginia's proposed redistricting reform. Um, I look forward to hearing the comments and thoughts from our next two speakers. Thank you. Evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all so, so much for being here. Um, I would say only in Arlington is a discussion about redistricting reform a hot ticket. Uh, but, uh, but I think that actually is changing around the Commonwealth thanks to uh, a lot of the reform-minded friends in this room who've taken this issue from something that we honestly discussed whether or not we should use the word gerrymandering five years ago or should we try to find some other word Right to now where it's you know packing a room in Arlington, right? So that's that's pretty good. So um, thank you to all the reform friends. Uh, thank you to the Arlington Committee of a Hundred for bringing this all together. Uh, th yes, they're very sure. <laughs> Thanks to Delegate Patrick Hope who reached out and I think kind of coordinated a lot of this behind the scenes. Uh, thank, thanks, of course, to Scott. I think you did a, a heck of a job on a, a way to tell him to stick with you because it requires that. Uh, and thanks for Delegate Levine for agreeing to do this. I, I, you know, I think we'll disagree plenty tonight, but I really admire the passion and the, uh, and the commitment to trying to find the right thing. We were talking at dinner earlier. It's a nice place to be now. Several years ago, we never thought we would necessarily be here, but we're discussing now what's the way to fix this. And we genuinely have an opportunity to do it. Uh, let me take a second and say who we are. I think most of you all are familiar with One Virginia 2021. You may have seen the big signs that say, you've been gerrymandered. That's us, that's our volunteers. Um, we're, we're very pleased with all of that. Uh, yeah, that's some in the back. Um, I am, <laughs> uh, the organization first, that's more important. Uh, I'm Brian Cannon. I've been fortunate to lead this organization for five years as executive director. Uh, um, and I, this is a weird issue to be an expert on. It's a small pool, right, to swim in. But, the, uh, but I had the privilege in 2011 of being in my last year of law school. And the League of Women Voters, who I cannot thank enough for carrying on this movement and, and helping educate me back in law school, uh, gave us the tools that the big boys used to gerrymander. They gave it to us in law schools and, and grad schools and colleges around Virginia to say, do this better. And I got to experience firsthand what fair mapping could look like. And I also got to experience firsthand how little the legislature cared about fair mapping at that time. We produced really, really good maps. They were completely ignored. Um, and the governor, uh, McDonald, who was paying lip service to it, set up an advisory commission, and they were really ignored. And they were pretty good maps, too. Um, so I learned a lot in 2011 from this. And I was, uh, I've been uh, pleased to be working on this for a while. The other thing that I, I think I hopefully I bring tonight's debate is that I've really had the privilege of getting to know the other versions of reformers around the country. The folks who got it done in California, the folks who got it done in Michigan, in Missouri, in Utah, in Ohio, in Colorado, like all over the country, leading experts on this. Uh, you could fit us all in a room about a half this size, um, but, but we get together fairly frequently, share best practices, and, I, and that's one of the things I hope we can do tonight is to kind of bring those things together for our, to inform our discussion. Um, let me say as a broad brush stroke on this that this is a complicated topic, right? And it is as important as it is complex. And so I wish there were a really simple solution that we could just, you know, snap our fingers and do. But the constitutional amendment is two pages long and I've got, a li I've got like seven pages worth of uh, enabling legislation that we can add to this. It's not an, uh, a simple process, but we can make it better. So there's three things I would like you to know about our proposal. 
Uh, the first is that our constitution is broken and we need to fix it. The second is about engagement. And the third is about the opportunities we have to make this better. Um, to the first point about the constitution is broken, our current constitution gives the power to the legislature to redistrict. It's just how a bill becomes a law, except it's really gross, and the governor signs it. We've got to fix that. And the only chance we have to change that line in the Constitution that says the legislature shall redistrict is this amendment. So, uh, so that's the first thing. Uh, the second is engagement. And uh, we have, uh, we've got a lot of great reform supporters in y'all's uh, community up here in Arlington. Your, your whole delegation has been on this way before it was cool. Uh, and specifically, I'd like to say uh, thanks to Senator Janet Howell, who put in the, uh, the, tra the transparency provisions in the amendment on the floor of the Senate. They weren't originally in there, and that's really, really important. <clears throat> And it's not just important as a, as a matter of, well, we should all be in for transparency. It's really important to think that this will be the first time redistricting will be done not in a smoky back room, right? Not with legislators making side deals in, in ways we can't see it. You heard that all the data is going to be public. All the, so that's huge. Um, and then the other part is this amendment is the, is the only opportunity to put citizens at the table with an equal voice in the process. And that's significant, too. It's never happened before in Virginia. Don't worry, trust me, I tried as a citizen to say, hey, here's a good idea, and they don't care. Right? So you gotta get them on the table, and this is the amendment to do so. So that's the engagement part. And then there's the opportunities. Um, what you heard in Scott's talk was a lot of kind of TBD signs, as I like to call them. And that. So there, there are a ton of opportunities in the enabling legislation uh, that we can use the framework of the amendment kind of as a cornerstone upon which we can build. We need to make sure we have a diverse commission that reflects the demographic, geographic, et cetera, diversity of Virginia. We need to make sure that we have clear rules in the commission that the commission has to go by that would actually bind the commission to do that. And these are all things that the legislature can pass in 2020 and the governor uh, hopefully will sign. I feel pretty confident we would. Um, and importantly, uh, we need to make sure, and, and this is to, to the kind of main point that Delegate Levine raises, is we need to make sure that we, if it ever gets to the Supreme Court of Virginia, and I think there's a lot of reasons why it might not, but if it ever did, that we bind the Supreme Court to hire a qualified special master, that's the kind of person who draws the maps, that's what always happens when, they, when a court gets it. Don't worry, the justices are not gonna draw the maps, they don't know how to do that. Um, but they'd hire somebody who was qualified to do the job, then you force that person through legislation to follow those rules that we set for the commission, those rules that protect our communities, that try to not divide us up seven ways to Sunday like we are now. Uh, you also force the special master to write a report detailing their findings, so there's got to be some extra element of transparency in there. And then lastly, I think if you have an immediate relative on, uh, if you are on the Supreme Court of Virginia or any court hearing things, and you have an immediate relative who serves in the legislature, you probably should recuse yourself. And those are four things we can do in enabling legislation to address the Supreme Court thing. Um, there are three kind of main issues, and I'll be quick on these, because I know Delegate Levine's gonna talk, uh, that, that I would raise with what L Delegate Levine and others have proposed, scrapping this amendment and coming up with something better. Um, by the way, I don't think this amendment is perfect. Like I said, it's a cornerstone upon which we can build, but I wanna make it, I, I wanna be clear that we cannot bind any future legislatures to do the right thing in redistricting reform. And that's really important. If you don't change the Constitution, it still allows the legislature to pass this as a bill, amend it as they will, and let the governor sign or veto it as he chooses. Um, we've got to do better than that. And when we're not talking about a constitutional amendment and building on that, we're not actually talking about really changing this process fundamentally. Uh, the second is minority representation. And I know we're speaking to a largely white room. We're in Arlington, but it's really important to think about this. Our state's 20% African American. Our state legislature is about 13% African American. That's abysmal. The reason is that is because both in 2011 and in 2018, we saw Democrats and Republicans mess this up. And 2011, I, I watched it. Actually, more Democrats voted for the racial gerrymandered maps in the 2011 legislature than Republicans did, because the whole Republican Senate voted against it at one point. Right, so more Democrats voted for the racially, that's sad, because there's actually diversity in the Democratic caucus, um, and, and yet that's what happened. 
Uh, and in 2018, they gave it back to the legislature uh, after there was a racial gerrymandering ruling from the federal courts and let them do it again. And I was really hoping we'd get a better process. The governor Northam would appoint an advisory commission of citizens in the affected communities that the governor would put, uh, that they would have get together with mapping experts and do their work, and they didn't. And I think that's the crux of what we need to pay attention to, and I realize my time is up, but I know we've gonna get, we've got a lot to get to. So without any further ado, Delegate Levine. So welcome everyone. Thank you again also, Arlington Committee on 100. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, everyone who cares, to make this a sold-out event. I uh, really appreciate the people who want to understand this amendment, understand what it does, and understand why I think we can do better. Um, Brian Cannon leads a very fine organization, One Virginia 2021. I know them well. I saw them outside uh, my precincts. I, I visit every one of my 23 precincts I represent on Election Day. And there's the One Virginia 2021 people. And they say, do you oppose gerrymandering? And people say, yes, I oppose gerrymandering. Sign right here. Um, and, you know, most people oppose gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is bad. Gerrymandering is unrepresentative. Uh, I would suggest, though, that if you oppose gerrymandering, you should oppose this amendment. And all those good people that signed that petition, they weren't given a copy of what it does. They were just said they oppose gerrymandering. Well, I also oppose gerrymandering. And even though it is true that in the 10 most gerrymandered states in the United States, nine of them have been gerrymandered by Republicans, and one, Maryland, was gerrymandered by Democrats. Democrats got one more congressional seat than they deserved. Republicans got about 40. So there is an argument to be made that Democrats should just gerrymander the heck out of it. But I think gerrymandering is wrong, and one day I would like to see a United States constitutional amendment that really solves the problem nationwide so that no one can be unfair. And I think that's something that hopefully we can all work toward. So let's talk about this bill. What may surprise you is that Brian Cannon and I agree a lot on the bill. What did he say? He said it wasn't perfect. I agree with that. Um, he says it needs a major enabling legislative fix. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, he says that, uh, you know, the judge, the sister of a sitting Republican senator, should recuse herself from the vote. Oh, I, I agree with that. Here's the thing. We are looking at amending the Constitution of Virginia, right? Constitution of Virginia. We're looking at enshrining forever these, sorry, did I mess this up? She'll fix it. <laughs> sorry. Uh, enshrining forever in the Constitution of Virginia, something that both of us agree is not the best way to do it. So I say if we don't have exactly what we're doing right, don't put it in the Constitution until we have it right. We can do this without going through the Constitution. If Brian's enabling legislation is the right way to do this, we can pass that this year without the constitutional amendment. We can get it done in 2021 based on that legislation. We can force the justice to recuse herself. And then we'll have 10 years to get it exactly right. And we, we, I agree we should eventually put it in the Constitution. But I don't agree that this is the only train leaving the station. Quick, it's imperfect, it's wrong, grab it. I don't think that's the way you amend the Constitution, particularly a Constitution this difficult to amend. If we amend it, we will probably never be able to unamend it. My concern is that this process will go to the Virginia Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court will choose a legislature that will choose this court, that will choose the legislature, that will choose the court, and since the legislature is the one to amend the Constitution, we'll never be able to unamend it. So let's not rush to enshrine forever something that we both agree are imperfect. This is not the only chance. Uh, so how does it do that? Why doesn't this wonderful commission that Scott laid out, why, why don't I think it's going to work? Well, first of all, it's called an independent commission, but it's really not independent. Uh, eight are legislators, that's true, and the other eight? Citizens are chosen by the eight legislators. They give a list and the judges winnow it down. So it's not like any of you can apply unless, well, maybe I'll put you on the commission, right? You have to be connected to the legislature. And, you know, I, Donald Trump can put Corey Lewandowski on a commission, but I don't think we think it's an independent commission if Corey Lewandowski's on it rather than Donald Trump, right? So it's not independent. And it's very unlikely to draw the lines. And the reason is because of D2 and D3 in the law, which all of you should read which says, and, and um, Scott pointed it out, 
It takes three or four legislators to agree on any map in the House, any map in the Senate. What does that mean? That means if two object, the whole thing dies. Virginia House, Virginia Senate dies. Congressional maps takes three objections. But basically, if Todd Gilbert and Kirk Cox say, you know what, we'd rather go to the Virginia Supreme Court. We don't want to do this commission. They just say no. The whole thing dies. Fourteen could agree. Todd Gilbert, Kirk Cox say no. The whole thing's dead. Well, why would they want the Virginia Supreme Court? Well, the Virginia Supreme Court is quite conservative. Why is it conservative? Because it's chosen entirely by the Republican majority House of Delegates and, and Republican Senate. So the Republican House of Delegates chose every single member of the Virginia Supreme Court. Republican uh, Senate chose a majority. Who's on the court? We got the sister of a sitting Republican senator. I think she'd recuse herself, but I don't think a law can do it because the Constitution trumps the law. That's the problem with his enabling legislation. All the court has to say is, we don't have to follow the law. It's in the Constitution. Just use the Constitution. The Constitution, it says in this amendment, gets to, the Virginia Supreme Court gets to establish the districts. There are no standards in this. Those of you who want to stop gerrymandering, please know, there is no prevention of gerrymandering in this constitutional amendment whatsoever. There are no standards here. And if we put them in, the Supreme Court can say, no, it just says we establish it. It doesn't even say, as one of the early drafts did, that it's decided by the courts, which suggests it's based on law. They don't have to base it on law. They just say established. They can do it themselves. Who are these people? Well, we got the sister of a state Republican senator. We've got the right-hand man of Ken Cuccinelli. You may remember he was put in when they kicked Jane Maram Rausch off the court because she was bipartisan, supported by Governor McAuliffe and by Dave Albo, the Republican head of courts of justice. She was too fair. They got rid of her. They put in Ken Cuccinelli's right-hand man. That's two. We've got a former Republican senator and, and delegate, that's Mims. And then we've got two others, I've been told, are somewhere to the right of Justice Scalia. Well, that's five out of seven. And, and then we're told, just, just trust them. Just, just trust these judges. I'm sure they'll do the right thing. Well, if this amendment passed, I sure hope they will. But you just heard Brian Cannon say, uh, in talking about McDonald, he just paid lip service and he went his own way. Why are we to think that Ken Cuccinelli's right-hand man or uh, the sister of a sitting Republican senator is going to do any more than pay lip service? You know, I, I trusted judges a lot more before Bush v. Gore. And after Bush v. Gore, I trusted them a lot less. We do not have to amend the Constitution this year. We can pass a law, that law, we can talk about how it should be done, my own preference, and I'm putting in two bills, but I'm, I'm willing to talk about others. Maybe I'll talk about Brian Kennan's enabling law. Make that into a law rather than a constitutional amendment. We'll have time to get the amendment right. But my bill lets a computer do it. And I want to be very clear about what my standards are because they're probably different from Brian's. My standard is not make the pretty little districts as rectangular as possible. That's not my standard. Squiggly lines don't offend me that much. My standard is we want the lines to represent the people of Virginia. Gerrymandering is not wrong because the district was shaped like a salamander, okay? That's good for the cartoonist. That's not why it was wrong. The reason it was wrong is because Governor Elbridge Gerry wanted to freeze out his political opponents. He drew a district in a way that was unrepresentative of the people of Massachusetts. That's why gerrymandering is wrong. So the, the, the computer program that I would design and put in the code, and by the way, I've been working with the same political scientists who went before the United States Supreme Court and established the efficiency gap. You may have read about it. These are a bunch of wonks, but they're designing this. These are some of the best professors in the country. We're working on a map that does this. It designs a map so that if exactly 50% of Virginians vote for Democrats and 50% vote for Republicans, if we have an exact tie, the districts come out 50-50. What could be more fair? And if more people vote for one party than the other, that party has the majority. It seems to me the fair way to draw districts is not so much the squiggly lines, but to make sure that the majority party should control the Commonwealth and the minority party should not. And we could put that in and we can make it so clear that anyone with a calculator, any mathematician, could look at our open source computer code and say, well, yeah, that's fair. And then we get the judges and the politicians and everybody out of the process. It's somewhat of a new idea, although Missouri just put it in, and we'll see how theirs works. And I'm not necessarily wedded to my idea, but I do think we can do it a better way, and I think we can do it without enshrining forever a really flawed proposal in our Virginia Constitution. Thank you, everybody. Hi. Um, 
I went to an event, uh, I don't know, a couple months ago, where uh, Sally Hudson pretended to be Brian Cannon. And Sally, who was a new delegate elected from Charlottesville, was saying that the critical part of this is enabling legislation. So I have two questions, one for Brian, one for Mark. Uh, to Brian, what specifically would the enabling legislation you're proposing do? And for Mark, if that enabling legislation puts sufficient strictures on the Supreme Court, would you then vote for the amendment? Great. Uh, I think that's a, a great uh, question and certainly grateful for Sally for pinch hitting for us. She's been, we sat in the back of privileges and elections before she was elected forever and watched her good reform bills die on ranked choice voting and our bills die on redistricting reform. Uh, so here, here's the thing, and, and I need to correct one thing that was said by Delegate Levine that we, it's in the Constitution that we can't tell the legislature, the legislature and the governor can't tell the Supreme Court what to do. That's simply not true. Article 6, Section 5, Section 1, section, oh, there's, a, there's a whole long thing where they can tell them rules and procedures for how they do their job. Uh, and I think that's really, really important um, because we can place those, those guardrails up on them. We can require them. We could tell them to wear purple shirts while they're deciding this uh, if we so chose. Um, obviously, that would, be a, that would be weird, but but we can't tell them what to decide. But you can put the guardrails up so that Whenever, whenever we've had special masters around the country do this, they've always kind of done a middle of the road job. Um, the Bernie Grothman, probably a Democrat, he did a fair job. And uh, you've seen the same thing in Pennsylvania and in, uh, to a lesser degree in other states uh, when they've had opportunities. So we really can bind the commission and we can bind the Supreme Court. What's important to know though is we cannot bind the legislature to do it. Anything leaving it in the legislature's hands is simply saying, trust them. And I wish we could, but I think it's kind of a hard truth we've come to realize both from 2011 and 2018 that we can't. So I don't think we can bind the Supreme Court on this amendment. I'd, I'd love, and maybe I'll give the mic back to Brian Cannon, if you could show me where in my Virginia Constitution we can bind them. Because, um, yeah, go ahead, ahead, please. I'd like to see it. Um, the amendment says, uh, not that the Supreme Court shall decide according to law. Doesn't doesn't say that. It says in Section G that if the commission doesn't submit a plan, remember in my hypothetical, Kirk Cox and Todd Gilbert say no, quote, the district shall be established by the Supreme Court of Virginia, period. That's the simplest part of this whole thing. Doesn't say any standards, doesn't say that we can bind them. And I could see a court saying, you know, thank you very much for your enabling legislation, uh, Mr. Cannon, Delegate Levine, uh, but a constitution trumps a law. That's kind of basic, the way constitutions work. Constitutions trump laws, this says we establish it, this has no standards, we're going to do it this way. Thank you very much. And if you want to appeal, go to, oh, you can't appeal. You can't. You can't appeal the United States Supreme Court because the Virginia Supreme Court is the last saying on Virginia law, and the U.S. Supreme Court has said, we're not going to touch political gerrymandering. There is no appeal. So if they say, this says establish, and it means establish, we can go nowhere. We must accept whatever they do. If we put a law in... Whatever law it is, we can set standards for the special master, whatever it is, and we can enforce that because we can pass another law. The Constitution trumps a law, so we can't control them. Sure. Delegate, it's, it's Article 6, Section 5. It, it, it says, the Supreme Court shall have the authority to make rules governing the course of appeals and the practice and procedures to be used in the courts of the Commonwealth, but such rules shall not be in conflict with the general law as the same shall, from time to time, be established by the General Assembly. Right. So what this says is, this says is that they can set rules. These are rules. These are, in fact, it's titled Rules of Practice and Procedure is the title of Section 5. So they have the authority to make rules, and they do. The Supreme Court has a whole rules of procedure. You can look them up. I don't think this is a rule of procedure. I think they will say, no, this is an establishment. Um, and so, yes, if they set rules of evidence, we can, we can control how that's done. I don't see how Section 5 controls this. Also remember, Section 5 is in the Constitution. This is in the Constitution. If you have a constitutional amendment, the more recent in time trumps the earlier one. So I think someone would just say, nope, this is the Constitution. Um, to the extent there's a conflict with Section 5, 
This governs, but actually I don't even see any conflict with Section 5. Um, to me, the, um, the point of the redistricting reform is to have a commission draw the map. Um, and this amendment creates a lot of room for the commission to simply fail and accept it, and simply accept it. Um, redistricting reform <coughs> fails if the commission doesn't actually have maps that are adopted. So my question is, and this kind of piggybacks on the debate happening just now, the Virginia Supreme Court can, in fact, just rule on what, you know, what the Constitution means. They can, and there is no appealing that. You know, we can sit here and argue about what we think it means, but the Supreme Court can't. So let's say they do say, look, we can simply draw the map, and the, you know, whatever we think the enabling legislation says, we can take it as advisory or ignore as we wish. What will be the remedy going forward for someone who advocates for this amendment? What's the next step after that? Because that will be an ultimate failure. What's the next step after that to you, Mr. Cannon? Okay, thanks. Sure, I would agree with you. It's a good question. I would agree with you it's a failure if this commission doesn't work. Um, it's a risk. Let me be clear. It is a risk. There is no perfect commission, and every commission that's worth its salt has a supermajority requirement embedded in it so that both sides are at the table, both sides get a, get a say in it, and whether it's two, three, or four people, they could kill most, I mean, even in the best reform commissions in California and Michigan. Uh, so that's a risk. I think what you got to think of is there's two, dead there's two options for um, a backstop to that. One option is commission fails and it goes back to the state general assembly and they do it the old fashioned way. The other option is it goes to the state supreme court. And while I think there's disagreement here, I think article six, section five is pretty clear. The general assembly can bind the supreme court to do good things. And if it does, I think that also disincentivizes people from trying to deadlock the commission to kick it to the courts, right? I think it's, it's, it's very clear we can do that. What the General Assembly can't do is send it back, or what the, what the commission can't do is send it back to the General Assembly because we know what that gets us. We know what that got us in 2011, and we know what that got us from proposed maps in 2018 from the Democrats. I'd love to think my team does better. We just don't. So we agree if the commission fails, it goes to the Supreme Court, it's a failure. I, you know what, I'm gonna, sorry to do this folks, it's a little wonky. I'm gonna read to you section five because I want you to hear what it says. Listen to how it talks about how it makes courts work and think about whether this section should even be used in redistricting. It's not that long, I promise. The Supreme Court shall have the authority to make rules governing the courts of appeals and the practice and procedures to be used in the courts of the Commonwealth. But such rules should not be in conflict with the general law, as the same shall from time to time be established by the General Assembly. Section five is about courts. That's what section five is about. It's about Supreme Court gets to control courts. It's got nothing to do with this amendment. It's, it's, it's not section five. I don't think we can bind the Supreme Court. I really don't. But here's the deal. If you like Brian's enabling legislation, and you think that's where the way to go, or we even have a better enabling legislation that makes commissions really work, let's pass that law this year, and that will bind us for 2021, and then we have time to get it right before we put it in the Constitution. Because here's the thing, if we get it wrong, and the Supreme Court says, as I think this amendment says, they can do whatever they want, they can ignore us, they can establish a gerrymandered legislature, worse than ever before. Nothing in this prevents gerrymandering. Nothing in this prevents gerrymandering. There are no standards in this. Very important. They can gerrymander it to favor Republicans, and they should if they want to keep their jobs. Because if you're the right-hand man of Ken Cuccinelli, you're probably unlikely to get Delegate Mark Levine's vote. But if you want to be reappointed, you're going to have to create a legislature that's pro-Republican. And then you create that legislature, they create you, they appoint you, you appoint the legislature, and we can't change this because it requires a legislative fix to change our constitution back. We're one and done. We can never undo this. That's the power of gerrymandering. It, it was hard to get the majority we got right now. And I've, I've argued that um, you know I don't want to see, and I'm a Democrat, everyone knows I'm a partisan Democrat. I'm not gonna try to hide that. But um, if we get, a blue majority for two years, and then we get 
systemically rad control, Republican control of Virginia forever after that, and we can't undo it, no matter, even if we get majorities, that's not fair even if you are a Republican. So I'd like to say, I don't, you know, call me cynical about the Supreme Court, don't call me Cassandra, the, the Greek goddess who warned of dire things that was never listened to. I fear this, and again, we can solve Brian Cannon's problem, but we can do it through an ordinary law this year, and then we can do amendments later on. Okay, let's get another question. Hi, so um, Mr. Cannon, at the, at the beginning when you were talking, you talked about how the 2010 maps were racially gerrymandered. And you talked about how the Democrats voted for that and how that was really uh, instrumental in trying to fight against gerrymandering. So in 2019, when the bill was passed, the Virginia Black Caucus voted against this amendment. So I want to know how, you can how we can address this is a really big concern. I think um, uh, Delegate Bagby has said he doesn't trust the Supreme Court. So um, I guess, uh, Delegate Levine, you would have some background on, on this vote, and I'd like to hear it, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, so um, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and let me correct a, a, a misunderstanding here. The Legislative Black Caucus did not vote unanimously against this bill, not even close. The entire Senate Legislative Black Caucus voted for that. That includes folks I really respect, Jennifer McClellan, Louise Lucas, Mamie Locke, uh, Senator Dance, um, and, and Senator Spruill even, who's been a little bit strange to deal with on redistricting reform. Um, but all five of those folks did, and then a lot of other folks, Charnel Herring, Jennifer Carroll Foy, others voted for reform as well. So there's split on this issue, and I think it's a tough issue in the black community. First, there's not a lot of trust. I just told you how they've been racially gerrymandered in 2011 and in 2018. The Democrats proposed maps that weren't much better than, or weren't any better than the Republican maps were as far as minority representation goes. So I understand there's a lot of distrust in the African American community, and that's why I don't want the legislature to have the power to do it again, because how many times do we have to see what they do before we realize that they underrepresent African Americans systematically, not just this decade, but for forever. We've got to do something different. So first of all, that legislature and the one I'm about to join next month, I suspect will be very different legislatures. And uh, I, I think we will not underrepresent uh, African Americans if, if we were to gerrymander, which again, that's not my preference. My preference is to use the computer model. But you need to understand about this vote last year is it came at us really fast, okay? Virginia 2021 did not get their way. Their bill was killed. Uh, Barker and Sass Law, which is what this amendment is, that amendment changed four times in three weeks, okay? And there were other things going on at the time, you may remember, back in February, in addition to 2,000 bills coming at us. I saw this amendment about 15 or 20 minutes before we could vote on it. I don't know how much time the senators had. I suspect it was very, very quick. And at the time, I remember saying, wait, whoa, Supreme Court, no. And my colleagues were like, Mark, you'll have another chance to look at it next year. We think enabling legislation can fix it. I said, all right, I'll vote for it, but I'm going to tell my, my constituents, and I put it in a letter that very day, hey, I'm not promising you I'm going to vote for this again. I will let it live because I know I will have a year to fully consider this. And I've taken that year. And I don't believe it's the right thing to do for all the reasons I've described. But all my colleagues have voted for it, and I voted for it too. Please cut them a little slack, because we all knew we'd have a second chance to vote on it. And I think the more people examine this, the more they read it. I don't know that most of my colleagues even had the chance to read all these details, to realize that two could kill the commission, to realize the Supreme Court just gets to establish it without criteria. We have 2,000 bills. We knew this one we get a second chance on. So, you know, I think uh, my colleague, Delegate Bagby, obviously is right. And um, I think, again, let's do it with a really good bill. Uh, even a bill that takes out the legislature, even a bill that creates an independent commission, that's great. In fact, one of my bills, I like the computer model, but I, I'm willing to compromise. I'm introducing a second bill that does exactly this, but takes out the Virginia Supreme Court. So that if the commission succeeds, we have the commission. And if, if, if Brian Cannon thinks this, the commission will succeed, we'll have the exact same commission. It just removes the backstop of the Virginia Supreme Court. The backstop would be, the backstop is the legislature because if the commission fails. But Brian said the commission won't fail. That's not my preferred choice. My preferred choice, as I said, is the computer. That's my second choice. 
Uh, Delegate Levine, you said in your opening that after Bush v. Gore, you don't trust the courts anymore. And then you said, and I think this is actually to your credit, a lot of folks voted yes for this and I hope they stick to it, but you said immediately the Supreme Court's a problem. However, in both 2016 and 2017, you co-patroned uh, redistricting reform amendments, uh, one by John Bell in 16, one by Ken Plum and another by John Bell in 2017, and they all went to the state Supreme Court. That was the default, because it's the highest court in the land and because we know the legislature sucks at doing this, and we can at least bind the Supreme Court into doing better things. And I, I, I think that folks make better calls about what's fair when they're in the minority, um, and Republicans were willing to get on board with this in large part because they thought they were about ready to not be in the majority anymore, and it turns out they were right. So okay. that's actually a fair point. Let me, let me let you in on a little transparency of how the legislature works. When you know a bill is not going to pass and you want to express general support for a principle, you usually co-patron it. I wanted to let people know I opposed gerrymandering. I knew the Republicans would never let this pass. And so I said, yeah, I generally oppose gerrymandering, and I do. But when you have 2,000 bills flying at you, you don't have time to read all the details of all the bills that you know are going nowhere. I've introduced bills myself. I have a great paid family medical leave bill. I introduced many years. I knew it was going to die each year. This year, I'm making sure I get all the details right, because I know it has a chance to pass. We have very little time. We have two months to look at thousands of bills. And the, the, the truth is, we focus on the bills that have a chance to pass. So this is directed to Delegate Levine. You said that the Supreme Court would be the one to draw the maps, and that's the end of the conversation, except it goes to the General Assembly to be passed up or down. So if the General Assembly is controlled by Democrats and they see a, Repub a red map coming at them, would they really vote for that? So that's a good question, but you, really, you need to look at the details of the bill. Here's what the bill says. The bill says the commission shall draw the maps, uh, and then it goes to the General Assembly for approval. If the commission does not agree, in fact, I will read to you section G. If the commission fails to submit a plan, okay, they have a second chance to submit a plan. If they fail a second time, the district shall be established by the Supreme Court of Virginia. So no, then it doesn't go back to the General Assembly. That, that's an interesting way to draw it, an interesting way to do it. That's not what this constitutional amendment does. And I think Brian would agree with okay. that. From my perspective, uh, Mark has uh, made a very persuasive case. Uh, Brian, what's basically wrong with the case that Mark is making? So the, the, what's wrong with it is that I want to put as many constraints on whomever's drawing the maps as humanly possible. Right? So I want down the middle fair maps. And we can do that to a commission. There's a lot of space in this amendment to build on to do that. We can also do that in the state Supreme Court. We can tell them to hire a special master. We can tell them to use these criteria. We can even use the efficiency gap and other mathematical measures to say that their uh, maps must meet those. I mean, these are procedures and, and practices of the Supreme Court. That's what the General Assembly and the governor control. What we can't control is the 2021 legislature. And I think the crux of the difference between our, our, our viewpoints here is that I don't trust the Democrats in the majority any more than I trusted the Republicans in the majority. And Delegate Levine made a good point that the folks there in 2011 aren't, a lot of them are there now, there's a ton of new folks, really good folks, and they're committed to reform. But then I saw what happened in 2018. Uh, and, and when we had a remedial maps, uh, opportunity for those because the federal court agreed that the 2011 maps were racial gerrymanders. They gave it back to the legislature sometime that summer and tell them you, told them you have until Halloween to fix it. The governor didn't appoint an advisory commission of citizens that were actually impacted by the racial gerrymander matched up with professional map experts. That had been a really good idea to try to find a fair map. They didn't do that. Instead, these new Democrats got together in their smoky back room and on a bunch of conference calls and came up with their own set of maps. And here's why I think we can't afford to do this. It goes back to the minority representation part. That there, are 12, there were 12 majority minority black districts in Virginia uh, under the current map. 11 of those districts were ruled a racial gerrymander. The Democratic proposal and the Republican proposal both only took us from 12 to 13. That's unacceptable in a state that's 20% African American. So, and, and you don't even have to take my word for it. Uh, New Virginia Majority has done amazing work on this issue for a really long time. And Jama Beckley King stood up and testified in that PE subcommittee, I think it was towards the end of September, 
and he called out the Republican map and the Democratic map in 2018, September of 2018, for not doing nearly enough to remedy the racial gerrymandering. There's risks in everything, but I think the risk of letting the legislature have to be able to do it the old-fashioned way, the status quo, we kind of know what that gets us. Question. So, um, just oh, real quick, um, <laughs> and, and I didn't draw those maps in Smoky Field Rooms because my district wasn't affected, uh, but um, uh, I, one thing we, I think we should also note is that Virginia and the country are changing, and I'm very proud of the fact that I know of at least four of our members, uh, Josh Cole, Charnell Herring, uh, Jennifer Carroll Foy, and Clint Jenkins, who are African-American elected by majority white districts. So, you know, we, we have, um, we don't have to have a majority African American district, I don't think, anymore in Virginia to elect that. But one thing I, I really want to make clear is that we can bind ourselves without using the Constitution. We decide this in 2021. We can bind ourselves in 2020 next year using the best criteria bill. Again, I'm going to push for my computer maps because I think that's the best way to do it. But if, if an independent commission, I would vote for a California-like commission. We can do it right in 2020 and actually bind ourselves by law. And if we change the law in 2021, all of you will know that we put in standards in 2020 and the exact same legislature changed in 2021 and then you'll vote us out of office. Um, we can bind ourselves for 2021, and then we can get a really good constitutional amendment in there for 2031, frankly, based on what we do in 21. Let's see how it works. Let's see if my computers work. If they don't work, you'll probably want a different solution. Hi. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, where, how we got to where we are, and, and a lot about you know, the, the questions and the problems of what we may run into the appreciate delegate living bringing our attention to all the pitfalls and the potholes that we're going to have to negotiate down the road what what we haven't heard is if we give up the bird in the hand for what what pro what prospect is there that the next legislature is somehow going to be more benevolent and come up with a better solution we're starting all over again where I gotta say, as a voter, as a citizen of Virginia, I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed by the voting, you know, gerrymandering that's gone on around here, and to have a federal court have to come down on us for racially gerrymandering is totally unacceptable. And we've gotta stop this, and, and I feel like this is at least a healthy step forward. You're right, if we don't like the way this works, We've got a lot of years ahead, you know, to do another amendment, but a lot of people put a lot of time and effort into it to get <clears> us this far, and, and if we abandon this effort, it's our last chance to get something in place before we use the 2020 census. Okay, thanks, let's. So, okay. a lot of people did put a lot of effort in, there's no question about it, and as someone who's a veteran of many, many fights on all variety of things, it's really hard to tell people, you've worked really hard, we're not there yet. But as a legislator, I have to look at what's best for Virginia and what's gonna go in our constitution. And if it takes a couple more years to get it right, I think we need to get it right. Don't just do something to do something, let's do the right thing. And I just don't think this is it. Hi there. Um, it only happens, you only have the chance every 10 years. And I think all of us in here know that compromise is important. Uh, two, two points with a question in here is one is with all the people that voted for, if you could remind us what the vote was the last time it came up, because it has to be voted on twice. I think the, and how you think people will react if the vote is different. But the other, the, and the obvious question to me is there's a difference in your interpretations of the authority of state, of the legislative statute being passed this year, the guardrails. Is there an opportunity for the attorney general to weigh in on that question and give people comfort in advance that in fact this new statute passed this coming uh, session, actually the guardrails are real and can bind the Supreme Court? So the vote total was 85 to 13 in the House, and it was 39 to 1 in the Senate. Um, the, I, I expect it'll be different, Jay. I think 
uh, we won't get quite that many because I think a lot of folks were able, you know, to do what Levine was saying, Delegate Levine was saying, vote yes one time to reserve the right to vote no. Um, but I do believe we have enough true reformers in there that we can get this thing done. Um, I, I would say about the getting the attorney general, let me suggest you all got a, 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 a like a one pager about enabling legislation that's got, you know, kind of our, our stuff there. Um, we've, you know, one Virginia has, has worked really hard on this, but we've also got a lot of really good allies. And national, really smart folks like the Brennan Center for Justice, like Common Cause, like Campaign Legal Center, um, you know, Nick Stephanopoulos, who, by the way, who came up with the efficiency gap, who, by the way, likes our proposal, um, proposed amendment. Uh, you know, all of those folks are helping us draft this enabling legislation. And they are very, very, very smart lawyers. They went to school, like Delegate Levine did, to very nice uh, Ivy League schools that I didn't go to. And so it's not us drafting this. It is, it is really smart folks saying that, yes, we can do this, and here's how best to do it. Here's what's going on in Virginia. We've seen, like, Del they, I think they're, they're going to take a lot from what Delegate Sia Price and Senator Jennifer McClellan have done. Uh, and they're going to combine it with the best practices they've learned in other states, because they've also helped draft those constitutions. So uh, Nick Stephanopoulos and I have a, a phone call scheduled for tomorrow. He's been working with me to design this computer model. Uh, and uh, he actually is one of the designers of the computer model uh, that I hope to put forward to, to actually be a fair model. So uh, I'm, I've got a lot of professors and people working on my side. And, and, and the point is this. If you like the enabling legislation and we agree on that, Let's put it in, and we're done for 21, and then we can work hard over the next few years to get a, a Supreme Court that does it right. I, I want to be clear, though, because I, and I haven't read the enabling legislation. I, I don't think I've seen that flyer. But I have seen past one Virginia 2021 proposals that I disagree with. I disagree with any proposal that puts geography over people. You can look at a map of Virginia. You see a lot of red and a little bit of blue on the map. But even in a majority blue state, because Democrats tend to live in cities and suburbs and Republicans tend to live in rural areas. If the map allows natural cracking and packing, allows natural gerrymandering to fit along a river border and automatically gives on average 50-50 votes, 55-45 Republican or 55-45 Democrat, I'm against that. Because the reason gerrymandering is wrong, I'm going to repeat this 100 times because I think sometimes people don't think about it, is not because of the squiggly lines. It's because it's unrepresentative. And I want a map designed by a computer, designed by Nick Stephanopoulos and others, that represents the polity of Virginia, not the geography of Virginia. I, uh, I agree with Brian, Delegate Levine, by the way. I think we should be aiming for proportional representation. It would be weird in a state like I had in North Carolina where it was a 50-50 state and they were 10 to 3 Republican. That's crazy. Um, and we shouldn't do that. Uh, if we let the legislature do it again, though, that's what we've gotten before. And so the, the way to ensure you can, it's kind of a, the good news is, is that the stuff Delegate Levine's working on, the stuff we're working on, can all be required of both the commission and of the Supreme Court to do. And that's crucial, because we cannot actually bind the legislature, and here's why. They just pass a bill, the governor signs it into law in 2020, and maybe it has the best mousetrap we could possibly come up with. I'm skeptical we could get the California model through Virginia even now, by the way. Um, but let's say we could. Then, in, I, I'm sure you would. I'm not worried about your vote. <laughs> uh, but, but, but let's say in 2021, they say, oh, man, my districts. It's like Gollum with the ring at the end of Lord of the Rings, right? Uh, oh, man, my district is up. I'd really like a reelection. I mean, you know, on one hand, Michelle Obama said go high. Uh, on the other hand, it's Republicans suck, right? Like, this is going to happen. I hear legislators talk about this all the time. And then to have them be able to pass another bill, which is what it would have to be, the, the maps would have to be a bill, have it go through the legislature, have the governor sign it again, can override what they did in 2020. Let's get one question in here. The pumpkin arrives in about three minutes. Delegate Levine, I think you're being naive about computers. They're programmed by people. People are political. And even when it spits out your maps, there will still be decisions to be made by people. How do you, how do you solve That's, that? It's a fair point. Um, first of all, I think the code should be open source so everyone can see exactly what's being put in. Secondly, um, a calculator that says 2 plus 2 equals 5, everyone recognizes as a faulty calculator. 
you can look at these maps and have a bunch of people weigh in and say they're fair maps or they're not. So people will be overseeing the process. It's not like it's all done in, in, in a dark room. Uh, and, and, to, and just to be completely honest and transparent, I do allow for a 1%, 1% deviation from the computer to try to stop the squiggly maps, to try to help communities of interest, to try to reach out to racial minorities. That's my bill. That's not saying that my bill is going to pass unamended. I do allow the 1% so that you know, we don't have like one precinct into Arlington and the rest of my districts, Alexandria, whatever. I do allow that 1%. I think that, that amount of room, that, but, I, but you can't be more than 1% unfair. And so that's, that's the way I propose the bill. Okay. All right. Scott, Could yes. I have a Finally, we get Scott thought, in here. Hopefully, a concluding impartial anecdote. Um, so, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, um, as is uh, my colleague here on the left. <laughs> Small world. Um, and a few years ago, Nashville had a vote on a transit plan um, because Nashville is the new bachelorette capital of the world, in addition to being Music City. And traffic is hellish in Nashville. It is awful. When I go home for the holidays, it's going to be terrible. So Nashville decided that we need to fix our transit problem. And the plan that they decided on was not very good. Um, it was ill thought out. It placed the most costs on the communities that would be the least served by the plan and a number of other flaws. And the voters of Nashville rejected the plan. Um, and I think this whole discussion has reminded me a little bit of this, and I'm not sort of coming out on either side. I'm just saying that traffic will still be terrible when I'm in Nashville next week <laughs> because the plan didn't pass. Um, but the plan that they could have passed might have made things worse, and that sort of whole discussion has reminded me of that. So I will leave you all with that thought, maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Scott, Brian, and Mark, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um.